Well, good afternoon. Hello, welcome. It's great to uh, see you and to welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're watching uh, online or on the DVD as well, it's a warm welcome to you where you are. Here to worship God and uh, to praise his name. Listen to what uh, we read in one of Paul's letters. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, whom I am the worst, says Paul. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, uh, we can sing, can't we, with, with joy in our hearts because of what Christ has done for us, coming into the world to save sinners. I say we can sing, we can't actually sing. We can hum along um, to uh, great uh, hymns and songs of the past. And because it's Christmas time, we're going to sing uh, some carols today. We're going to listen to some carols. And if you're at home, you can sing along. Uh, but we're going to listen and, and sing in our hearts to joy to the world, uh, the Saviour reigns. <laughs> some people to pray for and remember and um, some of you may know uh, Emmanuel uh, is uh, going in for a, a small operation um, this week on Tuesday to uh, remove uh, a, a small cancerous uh, growth so do uh, pray for Emmanuel and Simon and Marion at this time um, uh, they, they are approaching it with faith and, uh, and uh, prayer and uh, we, we want to uphold them um, before the Lord at this time of concern for them. Um, some of us have been getting vaccinations, which is good news, isn't it, that we're starting to have that process begin. Um, although Mike was due to get a vaccination this week, but uh, he arrived at the surgery and they told him, you can't have it for some reason. His name wasn't on the list or something, so he got turned away. So he's obviously quite disappointed about that. So pray for, for Mike that soon he'll be able to get it and um, that he'll be still encouraged in the Lord, even though that's been a bit of a setback for him this week. Now, um, <clears throat> I know that last Sunday afternoon, congratulations were, were given out to Georgie, but I wasn't here, so I'm going to just congratulate you anyway on your engagement to Dapa, and uh, I don't think that would have made it onto the video either last week, so <laughs> we're just noting that. We, we praise God for Dapa and Georgie's engagement. And, and also, some of you may not know, I didn't know until this week that um, our brother David Duby Jr. also, um, as I understand it, yesterday had some kind of marriage ceremony thing uh, uh, which involves the kind of the preliminaries of 
getting married. So I don't exactly know what, what happened there, but we can congratulate him too, uh, and Chipo on their um, forthcoming marriage at some point. Watch this space, I think. I don't know everything about that, but we, we thank God for those developments too. So with all that in mind and other things, let's come to God in prayer, commit ourselves to him. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we, we bow before you and quiet in our hearts in your presence. We thank you for your mercy in sending your Son into the world to be our Saviour. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Lord, we here can confess with the Apostle Paul. We feel ourselves and know ourselves to be the, the chief of sinners. We are aware of our own hearts. We're glad, Lord, that other people can't see in uh, to our hearts and, and what we're capable of and what we know we sometimes think or what our motives sometimes are, the hidden things of our hearts. Lord, though other people can't see them, you can see. And, and we're so grateful, Lord, that although you see, you also have forgiven us and uh, you have cleansed us from all our sins, even the ones we're unaware of, the things which have offended you, which you know about. And Lord, we thank you that your mercy has overflowed to us as it did to Paul. It's overflowed to us too and your immense patience has been shown to us. We thank you for that. How patient you are, how gracious. We worship you then today and pray for your blessing on us as we approach you, Lord, in the Spirit, through the Word of God, which he breathed out. We pray that Christ would be lifted up before us and we would be able to meet with him as we uh, meet with each other, or if we're at home watching, that we would be able to meet with you there. Lord, we pray that in our, all our different circumstances and concerns and uh, uh, the, the things which are on our minds, that you would speak to us and help us and encourage us. Especially, Lord, we commit brothers and sisters to you who uh, have particular concerns. We pray for Emmanuel and Simon and Marion at this time their family and, and ask, Lord, that you would watch over Emmanuel as she goes in this Tuesday and pray that the operation would be a success and she would uh, know um, a healing from, from this. We thank you that she hasn't been feeling at all unwell uh, and they've, they've caught it early. So we pray that that would continue to go well and that you would give them a, a real peace in their hearts about that. And Lord God, we uh, commit our brother Mike to you. We know he's been disappointed this week uh, with the hope of getting the vaccine and then uh, not. So we pray for him that you would you would encourage his heart, Lord, and draw near to him and remind him again and again that he is your child and you are watching over him at, uh, and caring for him at this time. And we thank you for good news from, for Georgie and Daper and uh, for David and Chipo. We pray, Lord, that you would bless these uh, young couples and make them fruitful for you. And, uh, and lead them in their lives in a way which is honouring and a blessing uh, for the gospel and for many other people as well as themselves. So Lord, we uh, commit ourselves to you, we commit our community to you, pray that as the cards and tracks go out this week, people might watch the video, might think about the Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps for the first time. We see some fruit, Lord, from these efforts to reach out at a very different Christmas this year. We pray that at this time people might especially seek for what they have not yet found and find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. So hear us we pray. Bless our time together. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to read part of God's Word now. It's part of the well-known Christmas story from Matthew's Gospel. It's Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, and uh, we're going to read the first 12 verses. This is the story of when Jesus is born, and uh, a little bit later on in his life, he is visited by uh, the wise men. So let's <clears throat> read this uh, lovely historical account of um, the visit of the wise men. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? 
We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and <coughs> worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And we thank God for that part of his word. Now I want to speak to young people and children, whether you're at home listening or whether you're here, um, you can uh, have a look at some things I'm going to show you on the screen. And I want you to see if you can tell me what these pictures are of. So Darcy, you're there. All right, the other two are here. Great. And Luke's here as well. So who can tell me what this is a picture of? Yes, Luke? A reindeer. Well done, Tilly, as well. Fantastic. So it's a picture of a reindeer. Now, what I want to know is, can I be a reindeer? No. Are you sure? What if... What if... <laughs> I put these on? Does that make me a reindeer? Rudolph the Redneck? No? Shame. Okay. So that's... that. Well, fine. So I'm not a reindeer. Well, okay. Well, what about this one, then? What, uh, who rather is this person? That's an easy one, isn't it? Oh, hands up. Whoa. Okay, Santa, yeah. Is that what you were going to say, Luke? No, I was going to say St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas, well, very clever. <laughs> okay, yeah, so he's, all, he's got lots of different names, doesn't he? St. Nicholas, Father Christmas, Santa Claus. So, let me see. If I couldn't be a reindeer by putting on antlers, can I be Father Christmas by putting on his hat? No. What about if I've got a big white beard? Would I still not be Santa Claus? No? What a shame. What if I went ho, ho, ho? No? No. Okay. So I can't be Father Christmas by putting on a hat. I can't be a reindeer by putting on the antlers. Well, let me think about um, this picture then. What do you think is this child doing? What is this child doing? Yes, Luke? Worshipping the Bible, or maybe he's worshipping God and he's got the Bible. Yeah, that's right. What else might he be doing, Emily? Pray. Might be praying, that's right. But actually, <laughs> does holding a Bible and closing your eyes like this mean you're a worshipper of God? Does it? Not necessarily, is it? Because putting on reindeer antlers doesn't make you a reindeer. Putting on a Santa hat doesn't make you Santa. So... Just saying words and holding a Bible doesn't necessarily mean that in your heart you really are a true worshipper of God. And so we have to ask ourselves, he, by the way, he might well be doing those things. You just can't tell from the outside, can you? God sees the heart. But what I want you to, uh, <clears throat> to think from this story we just read in Matthew's Gospel is there's a person there who says he wants to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, but he didn't really mean it. And we've got to look out for that in our own hearts. So he was a man called Herod. Here he is, do you see? Herod. He was the king at the time when Jesus was born. And the wise men, do you see them? They came to see him and they said, we've, we've heard that the, a king has been born. We've seen his star. Where is he? Now King Herod was a bit worried about this. And he thought, oh, I don't like the idea of another king. I like being king. I don't want another king around here. Thank you very much. But he was sneaky. He was sneaky. And he found out where this king was going to be. And he did that 
by asking his special clever men who knew about the Bible, where did the Bible say that the Messiah would be born? And, well, who can tell me? What answer did they give him? Do you know where the Messiah was to be born? Where was it prophesied? Yes, Emily? In Bethlehem, that's right, in Bethlehem. So they said, oh, king, the prophet Micah says that he's to be born in Bethlehem. And that's what they did. So he thought, ah, right. So he called the wise men and he said, well, wise men, it's so nice of you to come. And I want you to go and find this child. And when you find where he is, bring him here or send word to me because I want to go and worship him too. But did he want to worship him? No, he didn't. He wanted to get rid of him. So he didn't really mean it in his heart, did he? So it's possible to say, oh yes, I want to worship you, Lord Jesus, when actually something else very different is going on inside. And that's what we're taught in other parts of the Bible. Here's a famous verse from the Old Testament where the prophet Samuel says, people, rather, it's not Samuel who says it, it's God who says it to Samuel, isn't it? The Lord says to Samuel, people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So we've got to remember that. So putting your antlers on doesn't make you a reindeer. And saying, oh, oh, I'll worship you, Jesus, doesn't necessarily make you a worshipper. But we've got to ask God what David asked in Psalm 51. Lord, give me a new heart. Create in me a pure heart. I want to worship you. I really do. I want to mean it. I don't want to be like Herod. I want to be true in my heart and worship you uh, as I as I surely should do. So ask God for a new heart and you will be able to worship him really, truly, not like Herod. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take that psalm and we're going to turn it into a confession to God. We're going to do that all together. It's something that we do sometimes is we, we take part of God's word and we turn it into um, confessing our sin to him and asking him to forgive us and assuring ourselves from his word that he has forgiven us because of Jesus and we can have confidence in that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read parts that say me on the screen and then if you say all together the bits in yellow um, for the congregation then we'll work our way through some of the verses in the psalm and encourage our hearts and confess our sins to God. So let's do that together. Have mercy on us, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions. Wash away all our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Forgive us where we have had the outward appearance of worship, but not the heart. Create in us a pure heart, O God. Forgive us the sins that no one has seen but you. Renew a steadfast spirit within us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and grant us a willing spirit to sustain us. Take heart, people of God. Christ, the Lamb of God, has died for you. Open our lips, Lord, and our mouths will declare your praise. Well, having asked God to open our lips, we're not going to be able to open our lips as such, but we are going to hum along to a song which encourages us with the hope of the gospel. It's the carol, God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. And um, it talks about having tidings of gladness and joy because of what Christ has done for us in the gospel. So it's really appropriate as we remember that God has forgiven our sins.
We're going to read again from God's Word now in John's Gospel, John chapter 6, uh, this week. And I'm going to read a few verses from verse 35 down to uh, verse 40. I'm going to think about a few of these verses in a few moments. Let's first read John chapter 6 and from verse 35. Let's hear God's Word. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Let's uh, pray again as we come to God's word. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we praise you for your perfect word, and we thank you for these words, particularly of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And we ask, as we consider them together, that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your law, that we would see something more of the Lord Jesus Christ in his perfection and glory and his love and mercy. We pray, Father, that you would teach us and help us and encourage us and strengthen us for living the Christian life and for being witnesses to him in the week ahead. Be with us, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, for we need his power and influence as the word is preached. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It may have been a long time ago that you asked this question that I want you to think about today. It might have been a long time ago, but virtually everyone asks it at some point. It's it's normally um, when we are children that we ask it of our parents. And it's this question. Mummy, Daddy, where was I before I was born? I, we've got one or two young people, children here. Have we ever, you ever asked that question? Where was I before I was born? Well, recently in our house, we were talking about that because I think we were talking about um, Miriam and, and my wedding day. And uh, I think one of the, the girls, you know, they said, well, where was I? Well, what's the answer to that question? Well, we, of course, we, we normally say something, well, well, the darling, you, you weren't there. You hadn't come into mummy's tummy yet. You know, you just weren't around. But that's the question, where were you before you were born? And I, I ask you that as, a, as an adult, you would say, well, I was nowhere. I, I didn't exist. But if you ask Jesus that, he doesn't have to say that. In fact, he, he won't say that. 
which means that you and I have to listen to him because he's different. Where were you, Jesus, before you were born? He's got an answer for that and it's not nowhere. And that's why Jesus has to be at the heart of Christmas because uh, he is so different. He stands apart from the rest of us. He must not be at the fringe then of your Christmas or your life. He must be at the heart because he says that when he was born, he had already been somewhere else for a very long time indeed. Yes, he began to be a human baby, but they, he did not therefore begin to be like us. We read at the start of this service, 1 Timothy 1.15. Remember it? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came into the world. He, he came from somewhere else and entered our world. Now, of course, we, we do tend to use language a little bit like that when we talk about the birth of any baby. We say that, when, you know, when's the baby coming? Or did, when did the baby arrive? And that's true. We do speak like that. We say the baby came on a certain day at a certain time. But we don't mean, do we, when we say that, that they have come or they have arrived from somewhere else where they'd been beforehand. But that's what Jesus meant when he spoke. We didn't read this particular verse, but in John chapter 16, Jesus says to his disciples, I came from the Father and entered the world. He, he, he was with the Father before he became a human being. A few verses later in John 17, he says to his Father, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So the entrance of Jesus, the baby, into the world was a sending of a person who'd existed before, elsewhere, in heaven, into our world. So yes, babies are conceived, every human baby is conceived and born, and so was Jesus, being a true human baby, but he was also sent. He also came. And here is where it particularly then concerns you and me. The whole reason he came was because of you. The whole reason he came was for other people, for us. You matter. And so he travelled. He came. We sing it in another Christmas carol. He came down to earth from heaven who is God and Lord of all. That's describing the biblical truth of the incarnation. He came down to earth from heaven. Now why would he do that? Why would he specifically do that? Well Jesus himself tells us frequently throughout the Gospels in fact he gives a reason more than one reason, many reasons why he has come, why he's entered this world in uh, the person that, as the person he is. In John chapter 9, for example, he says, I've come so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. In Mark chapter 1, he says, I have come to preach good news. In Matthew chapter 9, he says, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. In Luke chapter 12, he says, I've come to bring fire on the earth. In Matthew chapter 10, he said, I've come to turn a man against his father. In Luke 19, he says, I've come to seek and save the lost. In Mark 10, he says, he's come not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. In John 10, he says, I've come to be glorified by being lifted up on the cross. I've come for this reason. I've come for that reason. I've come for the other reason. But in all of them, I've come. I've arrived. I'm here. And so what I'd like to do in, in this, uh, on this Sunday and then on Christmas Day, God willing, and uh, next Sunday, the 27th, God willing, is to um, just choose three of these reasons that Jesus gave as we think about Christmas. Why did Jesus come, according to Jesus? Why the manger? Why uh, Bethlehem? Why the incarnation? And so there's three that I'm choosing. You could sum up like this. Today, I want us to see 
that Jesus came to obey. On Christmas Day, God willing, I want to see that Jesus came to shine. And next Sunday, God willing, Jesus came to fulfil. Jesus came to obey, to shine, to fulfil. So um, that's where we're going, the next three messages, God willing. And today then, I want us to focus on this idea of Jesus coming in order to obey. And that idea is found in those verses that we read in John chapter 6. And particularly, John chapter 6, verse 38, there it is on the screen, where he says that, um, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. In other words, this is the first thing I want you really to see. Coming meant obeying for Jesus. The, the whole thing of his coming is wrapped up in his obedience to the will of his Father. Not come to do his own will, but to come to do the will of his Father. So, why that first Christmas? What was the baby doing in the manger? Why did he stop dwelling in heaven? What was going on? Why does the eternal word who spoke worlds into being now have vocal cords that he didn't have before, which are screaming for milk? Why does he have bowels from which to eject any milk he doesn't digest? That's the level at which he's becoming like us. Why had the Son of God come like that? He says he'd come to obey. To obey. I've come not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Not to please himself, not to do just whatever he fancied, not to be super baby where he uh, kind of does miracles from his cot and shows off when he's just five or six weeks old by solving riddles and mathematical equations, not to show how great and wonderful he is by banging in Joseph's carpentry nails with his little finger, some kind of, this is, a, this is the me show. No, he'd come to do his father's will, to always be submissive to what his father in heaven wanted him to do, to carry out all the detail of a plan that would end up saving all his people from their sins, a plan which they had um, which they had agreed on together from all eternity. And that meant true humanity. That was the plan. It had to be true humanity, which meant then infant needs, infant hunger, infant ignorance, infant helplessness. Why? Why those things? Why does he have to become like that? Why? Because you had all of that once, and I had all of that once. I had infant needs and so did you you had infant hunger and infant ignorance and infant helplessness and so he has to become that too if he's going to be your true substitute on Golgotha's cross he would have to make his way there in every respect like you so that he can be a true sacrifice in your place so coming meant obeying Obeying all that the Father was asking him to do and to be. Coming, therefore, meant, as Luke chapter 2 says, growing in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and with man. Coming meant saying no to sin when he was five and when he was 15 and when he was 25. Coming meant loving his younger brothers and his sisters day and night. It meant saying, yes, mum to the woman that he had created in her mother's womb just a couple of decades before. It meant submitting to her and to his earthly father, Joseph. It meant having no other gods before Yahweh in his life, always saying, yes, Lord, your will be done. It meant every word coming out of his mouth being gracious and good and true. Every single word, every expression, every syllable being upright and good and wholesome and holy. It meant resting completely on the Sabbath and resting in God every moment of his life. It meant maintaining sparkling purity in all his thoughts and all his motives. It meant a holy contentment with his calling in all its dimensions at every moment. It meant holy war with the powers of darkness. It meant keeping his mouth shut when falsely accused. It meant losing all his friends. It meant nails hammered into his hands. 
and wrath poured out upon his soul. And it meant slaying death and striding out of the tomb. It meant telling his disciples that all was forgiven. And death has lost and the world is invited. That's what it, that's what it meant for him to come into the world, to obey the Father's will. All of that was the Father's will and he did it. And so much more, just scratching the surface there. I'm saying coming meant obeying and obeying for you. So that today you might bow your head before him and say, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for obeying for me so that you'll be my substitute. So will you do that today when you say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Coming meant obeying, and that is good news for us. Okay, coming meant obeying. Second thing I want you to see is obeying meant holding. Obeying meant holding. I'll explain what I mean in just a moment. Let's just come to the next verse, in verse 39, where Jesus gets very specific about which particular <laughs> aspect of the Father's will he is thinking of here when he's talking about doing that will. He's thinking of this aspect because if you were to look back in the little passage there in John 6, you'll see that in the conversation he's having with certain people, a good number of them simply don't want to believe in him. They will not put their faith in him. And so he wants to make it clear as he speaks that in spite of their rejection and unbelief, it is still the Father's plan to save a whole host of people from their sins. Even if they won't have him, others will. And those people will therefore come to believe in him as their Lord and Saviour, and it's guaranteed. Well, how will that salvation that's guaranteed be accomplished and sealed and certified? How? By Jesus holding on to those whom the Father has meant for him to rescue. Holding on and not letting go. That's what I mean by obeying men holding. And that's because it says this in verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. He's not going to lose any of his people. And that's so important and helpful and I hope encouraging for us if you're a Christian. Because if you're a Christian, you may well have had times where you feel you might not be able to keep going. You might think, well... Oh, this is hard. This is a bit of a slog. Sometimes you might feel that things are too much for you for one reason or another. Or you might feel that a certain temptation is just, just going on and on at you and it might just get to be too strong for you and you're going to collapse. Or maybe you have actually fallen into that sin you're being tempted to do and now you feel utterly hopeless because you gave in and you feel guilty and horrible and you feel that God, oh, he could never possibly sit with me now. What hope do I have? Well, these words of Jesus are just for you then. When you feel like that. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me. I won't lose any of them. Whatever stumbles and falls and failures and trips they, they experience, I won't lose any of them. Jesus says, I will raise them up at the last day. He has in view that day when you will step over the threshold into eternal life and you will finally make it. You will be a success at the end. And at last, you will put behind you all the trials and temptations and troubles and failures of being a fallen human being. And that will be over and that will be the past. That will be gone. You will make it. That's what the day he's talking about. Raising his people up at the last day, whole and complete and righteous and bright and dazzling and radiant with the glory of God. And we look at that and we think, really? Am I going to get there? Jesus says, I want you to be clear about how you're going to get there. He says, I'm going to get you there. I shall lose none of all that the farmer has given me. You, brother or sister in Christ, you are not going to drag yourself over the line and collapse in a heap at his feet for him just to say, 
Oh, well done, you mate. I've been waiting for you. Well, you, you, you got her in the end. Well done. Good job. It's not going to be like that. That's not what he says. He says, no, I am taking you there. And I will not lose you. I am not going to let go of you. I am holding on to you until you get there. I've got you. And I will never lose you along the way. That is the will of the Father who sent him. That he will lose none of you. It's his job to do that. Not yours. That will of the Father of him to do that cannot be altered. And as we have already seen, there is not a chance in heaven or earth or hell that Jesus will not obey his Father's will at any point. So not at this point either. To come meant to obey. And to obey meant to hold on to his people. Here's the astonishing thing. Here's the, here's the thing you really need to just consider for a moment. What Jesus is saying is this. If you fail to reach that day of resurrection in one piece, if you fail to get there, if you do not make it in the end, to whose everlasting shame will that be? It will be to his everlasting shame if you fail to get there. Because it's his job to hold on to you until the end. It is his reputation on the line. It is his honour and power and glory and obedience which are at stake, not yours. His is his role to keep his people all the way to the end. And if you then, weak, tottering, frail Christian you, do not make it to the end, it will mean either one of two things. Either that Christ is incapable of doing what his father willed for him to do, or that he is simply flagrantly disobedient. But folks, neither of those are on the table. Neither of those are anywhere near the table with the Lord Jesus Christ. The very reason he entered Mary's room in the first place, he's saying, was to do his father's will. And boy, did he pass that exam with flying colours. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Brother or sister in Christ, you are secure forever. You are secure in Christ. It is not dependent on you. It is dependent on him. All who believe in him will be kept to the end. They'll be kept by being given perseverance. They will keep going, and he will never forsake them, so he will never forsake you. Obeying for Christ meant holding on to me and holding on to you. And he means to do it. So keep going. Keep trusting him. Keep persevering. Keep holding on even as he holds on to you. So that's the second thing we've seen. First, coming meant obeying. Second, obeying meant holding. Thirdly, briefly to bring us all together. Holding means holding. Holding really means holding. And you think, well, what, why are you repeating yourself? Um, I'm repeating myself really in a way because that's what Jesus does in verse 40. He says this, basically the same thing. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. Just in case you hadn't got it the first time, just in case you needed any confirmation of what he is saying, if you are believing in him, and you need to believe in him, it's not just a carte blanche for anyone in the world, it's for those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're doing that, you are safe because he don't let go. Coming meant obeying, obeying meant holding, and holding means holding. I will raise him up at the last day. All who hold on to him will find themselves held onto all the more powerfully than they could ever grip onto him. We began with a question today, with a question that children sometimes ask their parents. Where was I before I was born? And we've seen something of how the Lord Jesus would answer that for himself. And we're going to end in a similar kind of way with another question that children sometimes 
ask their parents a different question, but perhaps an equally common question, at least in my short experience as a parent, I can say it's fairly common. This question normally uh, gets spoken at the park, <clears throat> and it normally gets spoken when uh, the, uh, a child is on the climbing frame, for example, and the child goes up the climbing frame and they feel they've just got a bit too high to be able to manage for themselves. And they really would like to get down where they can't do it themselves anymore. And so um, they're up there and they look down at mum or dad and they say, uh, can you help me down? And, and then they say, have you got me? Have you got me? Mum, you, have you got me? Dad, have you got me? And dad or mum, they, they say, yeah, yeah, I've got you. I've got you. Don't worry if you... If you, if you let yourself go now, okay, I've got you. You won't fall. You're safe. I've got you. Now, if the dad or mum is telling the truth, they're not, <laughs> they're not going to go, hey, I'm going to let you go. I'm not going to do that. If the dad or mum can be trusted to be reliable and has the sufficient strength to back that up by actually catching the child when they jump, then the child cannot be harmed, can they? It will come to no harm whatsoever. Because dad, mum, has got them. I'm saying it all depends on the parent, not on the child. Not can the child kind of accurately jump into the arms in a way that's acceptably kind of suitable for being caught? No, no. It's all dependent on the strength and willingness of the parent to do the catching. Dad, have you got me? Yes, I've got you. All depends on him and not on them. Now, that is a question that if you're a Christian, it's okay to ask the Lord Jesus Christ. It's okay to say, perhaps when you feel that life has got too precarious for you, you've got too high up and you're not sure how you're going to get down. And you can say to your Saviour, Lord, have you got me? Have you got me? And he will always say, yeah, I've got you. I've absolutely got you. And he is telling the truth because he can't do anything else. And he has certainly got the strength to back it up. Coming meant obeying. Obeying meant holding. And holding means holding. You can entrust your very life to him and know that you are safe with him now forever. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for the willingness and the ability of the Lord Jesus Christ to hold on to us. We pray you'd encourage us with that thought that this week he has got us and he won't let us go. Lord, if we're here or we're watching the video and we've never Put our faith in him. Help us to put our faith in him now. And to find that wonderful promise is there for us. That he shall raise us up too at the last day. We thank you for your word, Father. We pray you to seal it to our hearts and help us to see how it applies, particularly to our lives in the week ahead. We ask for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to listen to uh, one last carol now, which uh, is Once in Royal David's City, um, which in one of the verses says, and through all his wondrous childhood, he would honour and obey. So there's that thought of him obeying uh, his parents, obeying his father, coming down to do that very thing. So we will uh, hum along to this and thank God for these wonderful words. <laughs>
Now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. Amen.